Hello and welcome to Wessex Museum's first ever podcast series, Interrogating Hardy. This series we will be focusing on Thomas Hardy and if he is the unique hero we, or at least I, would like to think of him as. My name is Harriet Still and I am the Wessex Museum's Hardy curator, as well as being the host of this podcast. Thomas Hardy once said, What are my books but one plea against man's inhumanity to man, to woman and to the lower animals? His desire to fight this inhumanity and inequality shaped his works, both poetry and prose. He turned to writing in his 30s and used this medium to promote causes of those he saw as oppressed, as well as capturing a fast disappearing way of life. This is also the core of the four new exhibitions by Wessex Museums, Hardy's Wessex, running simultaneously at Dorset Museum, Pool Museum, the Salisbury Museum and Wiltshire Museum. This aptly named podcast series will question how far his writing did speak about multiple issues, if writing alone was enough to call him an activist, and how this can reflect our own time. Hello everyone, today's episode of Interrogating Hardy will assess Hardy and his views on the social inequality of the land. But first, before we get into it, let me introduce our two fantastic guests for the show. We have the brilliant Harvey, a master's student at the University of York, who's studying international political economy with a keen interest in ecology and the social inequalities of the environment. And also we have the incredible Lila Simons, who is an organic farmer at Tamarisk Farm down in West Bexington on the Dorset Jurassic Coast. And we'll be bringing Thomas Hardy and his views on agriculture into the modern day. Welcome, welcome. So lovely to be joined by both of you. Lovely to see you here. Thank you. Lovely to meet you, Harvey. Thank you very much for having me. You're very welcome. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. And this week we are looking at Hardy and the environment. But of course, this is a massive thing because our, our definitions of environment have changed since Hardy's day. And so what we now see as the kind of really important things to focus on, maybe Hardy didn't really see coming. Whereas the things that Hardy really focuses in on sometimes now seem a bit irrelevant. Um, but just to summarise, I found this quote, which is talking about the disconnect between, in Hardy's day, there was increasingly this disconnect between a rural population and an urban population. And there's this quote from Tesla Dubervilles, which is Tess saying to Angel when they go to take the milk to the train to go up on the train to London. Londoners will drink it at their breakfast tomorrow, won't they? She asked. Strange people that we have never seen. Noble men and noble women, ambassadors and centurions, ladies and tradeswomen and babies who have never seen a cow. And Angel answers, well, yes, perhaps, particularly the centurions. But then she adds, who don't know anything of us and where it comes from, or think how we two drove miles across the moor tonight in the rain that it might reach them in time. And so that's, that's going to be my starting point um, to introduce this podcast, is the idea of the disconnect in Hardy's day. In 1851, it was the year that the population changed over from being primarily a rural population to suddenly it was far larger urban population. And the rural areas were still having to uh, produce the food that was being sent up to these urban centres. But there's increasing this kind of disconnect between the urban people that, as Tess says, have never seen a cow um, and the rural people who are driving across the moor to try and get them their milk in time for breakfast. But this is then reflected in Hardy's writing. He obviously is writing mostly about a rural population. And so we've got um, him describing the people, how they interact with that landscape, how they interact with the wildlife in that landscape, um, the way that agricultural practice was changing at this time, it's becoming far more intensive, far more mechanised, and the social tensions that arise because of that. And also the other thing that's coming in is a change in tenancy, a change in housing. And although this seems like quite a strange, small thing to focus on, it completely changes the social structure of um, the world that Hardy is talking about and the way that people interact with the landscape, feel rooted in the landscape, feel some kind of security and identity with the landscape. So those are the things that we're going to be looking at today. Uh, we've got Lila with us, who is from Tamarisk Farm down at West Bexington in Dorset and who has been farming that organically in, in partnership with Soil Association. Yep. Yeah, my grandparents uh, joined the Soil Association pretty much when it began in the late 60s, early 70s. And you've been managing that in various schemes as well, like the um, stewardship scheme. And you can probably explain it far <laughs> better than I can. Yeah, there's, there's lots of different, um, so triple SI, sites of special scientific interest, SNCI, uh, special nature conservation 
interest. Um, we're an AONB, um, the World Heritage Site, um, and as well as all of that, we work under various different government implemented um, HLS schemes, which is a countryside stewardship scheme. Whereas Harvey, you're coming at this more from kind of ecology and and also looking at the, the heritage of that ecology and how people interact with the landscape, I understand. Yeah, uh, so I'm currently a, a student at the University of York doing a master's in political economy, but I, I primarily focus on the sort of uh, political ecology and the historical background of our, our, ecolog like our current ecological crises, as well as uh, the intersections of, of that crisis with our economy and uh, society as a whole. Brilliant. So I suppose what I'm trying to put across in this podcast, me holding the Hardy flag, is to say that I think Hardy at this point was trying to show the rural world in a way that most writers weren't showing. It had been romanticised by people like Wordsworth, but without actually knowing the people particularly very much kind of standing apart socially, um, like Wordsworth was in a completely different world from, say, the tramp woman that he writes about. But I think Hardy is very much more in tune with these people. And so what I'm trying to put across here is that Hardy is showing rural life um, with a kind of reality that most other writers weren't doing and also engaging with the natural world in a way that most writers weren't doing. Um, so I suppose I'm going to first off probably set myself up to be knocked down by Harvey by saying that Hardy, I think, does a really, really close examination of nature and he's looking at things like the way that um, farming practice interacts with nature. So you've got things like Jude the Obscure as a boy going and throwing stones at the birds because he's paid to do so when they're eating the corn that's been thrown on the newly ploughed um, fields. But Hardy then disagrees with us and says, you know, through Jude, that he feels this kind of common magical thread that joins him to the birds. And that sense that the farming shouldn't somehow be in con conflict with the ecology of the local area and the wildlife of the local area, and they should somehow be able to work alongside each other. Um, I suppose I'm saying Hardy was amazing at this, he's doing it. Harvey, can you knock me down? Can you tell me what other Victorian writers of the time were doing and how was how did the Victorians see their farming practices interacting with the natural world? I wouldn't necessarily knock him knock you down for saying that because I think <laughs> it's quite a novel view of um, agricultural practices at the time being uh, in disequilibrium with uh, the natural world. Because at the time around the Victorian era, the, a lot of the focus on environmentalism did come from the likes of, you had George uh, Perkins Marsh, who wrote uh, Man and Nature in 1864, which really was like one of the first modern texts to directly deal with man's relationship with nature, and in it included uh, agricultural practices um, and the need for sustainability. But you had others also writing at the same time, uh, from a more scientific point of view. So it was less the, the thing that Hardy highlights, uh, the social intersections between agriculture, the environment uh, and society. Uh, you had uh, William Javons instead writing about ecological and environmental issues in 1865, uh, writing uh, primarily about um, pollution and the effects of pollution. But in terms of... Uh, agriculture i think that there's a certain novelty to hardy's thoughts and writings at the time but it's within a wider background of this very uh, this big push in europe at the time for uh, making a science of the environment with um, the term ecology being coined by um, ernst heckel uh, in 1866 so it was it was very much in this background of a growing environmental awareness throughout um, European societies. And do, do any of these people recommend kind of practical ways of farming your land in line with the local wildlife? Because I'm one thing I, I worry is that Hardy is coming at this actually as someone who was a builder's son. He didn't ever have to work with the land. He didn't ever actually have to rely on the land to give him his livelihood. And so it's all very well him saying, let all of the crows eat all the seed. But was anyone actually suggesting practical ways of making this work? I guess there's not there's no concrete policy suggestions um, as far as I'm aware from 
uh, writers at this time, it's very much follows in the same footsteps of a more general feeling that, uh, such as John Ruskin, who later in his life would write about um, pollution, uh, uh, would also talk about how we need a harmonious relationship between man and nature. But again, it's just more of a, a vague calling to a to a higher sense of society alongside nature rather than against nature. So I wouldn't say he like Hardy's particularly uh, at fault for being idealistic. I think that could possibly be chalked up to just the a Victorian mentality. Good. That's. I'm glad to hear that Hardy has got some points back there. But I'm also looking at Lila because I feel Lila has some stories about pigeons eating peas. <laughs> <laughs> I do have some stories about pigeons eating peas. So um, yeah, hearing about Jude as a boy going out and being paid to throw stones at them, I can completely sympathise. We've been trying to grow, admittedly, admittedly, a relatively small crop of peas, about or maybe only an acre. Um, but every year the pigeons have eaten most of the pea crop. Um, and so we've been out there, not with stones, um, but with our with our shotgun trying to scare them off it. Not particularly trying to kill the pigeons, we just want them to not be eating yeah. our pea crop. And we haven't yet succeeded in growing the pea crop without the pigeons eating the vast majority of it. <laughs> Because there's, there's a story that Hardy, um, in his garden, there was a hare that kept him breaking into the garden. And Hardy wanted to be self-sustainable and he wanted to be able to grow all his own vegetable in his vegetable plot. But this hare kept on coming in and every time it came in, it eat everything off. And the gardener got so frustrated with it that he um, he was just constantly chasing this cat hare and trying to find ways of catching this hare and trying to find ways of getting rid of it. Um, and Hardy was really angry at him because he felt that there should be a way that they could grow the vegetables and their hair could also eat the vegetables. And this poor gardener is there just completely not knowing what to do about it. But it sounds quite like, <laughs> like, like he was he was Lila trying to go, I just need to grow my vegetables and then not have a hair come and eat it all. Um, in which case I feel that Hardy maybe, I, although I know I'm meant to be in the Hardy camp, I feel that maybe Hardy was a little idealistic. I would, I would say that in that particular one, yes, that that is a lovely idea. Um, and one of the theories about why we have pigeons eating our pea crop is that we are only doing one acre. Mm. So the, the pigeons go, oh, perfect. That's just the right quantity of peas for me. <laughs> um, whereas if we did 10 acres of peas, maybe our pigeon population would be like, well, I'll take some of it, but I can't deal with the rest of it, it's too much. And that's one answer. But um, yeah, you, you can't really share your crops that you want to produce with the wildlife to the exclusion of getting your own crop unfortunately <laughs> so ha having said that hardy is now um, maybe a bit of an idealist although it sounds like from what harvey's saying he's an idealist amongst idealists in this period it sounds like no one really had an answer and it sounds like lila doesn't really have an answer today either <laughs> so at least we don't feel that hardy is losing out or kind of being shown in a particularly bad light um but I feel, feel like this also quite naturally moves on to the idea of mechanisation and how you're actually farming that land. Because in Hardy's writing, he quite often talks about things like uh, the tyrant of the threshing machine that's constantly driving people onwards and onwards and the idea of their muscles aching because they're trying to keep up with this machine that just obviously doesn't get aching muscles, just keeps on going mm -hmm. on and on. And he also talks about um, things like the conversion of heathland into farmable land, and this kind of drive to effectively you know, tame the landscape through mechanisation. He also talks in books like The Withered Arm about, in, in a very tangential way, but about the arson attacks that were happening in the 1830s and the 1840s on threshing machines and on hayricks, where people were protesting the use of threshing machines because they felt it was putting them out of jobs. And so I was just wondering if that's something we could move on to. Now we've talked about Hardy being a rather idealist in the idea of animals being able to coexist with um, farming practices in that way. What about the idea of humans and how they interact with farming and whether things are done by hand or whether things become more mechanised? What was the general feelings, Harvey, in this time more widely? Were people seeing threshing machines as a as a kind of tyrannical thing or and, and the swing rioters were kind of the majority or was that actually just a tiny minority? There was certainly like an anti- I guess uh, techno po po like a possibly anti-technology sentiment uh, in England. You had 
they, they, they were English textile workers, but you had um, Luddites as well, which I think you can't separate possibly from um, from the, these kind of uh, acts of arson against them. There was this creeping sense that the people were being driven out of a job. But I think also the land enclosures at the time were also a big threat. So this combination of land being more efficiently uh, utilised through machinery, coupled with already um, disintegrating peasant research, peasant system of land management, certainly would um, uh, instil some uh, rebellious attitudes, to say, to say the least. Well, because because in in Dorchester they had um, yeah they had the swing riots in what's it eighteen thirty it hit Dorchester, and then most of the swing rioters got transported. Um, the following year, but Hardy said that there was um, a case that his father saw where there was an 18-year-old who was hanged just for being present at a rick burning, not even being part of it. He just went along to see the fire because he was excited by it. And Hardy says later on in life, that was one of the things that brought home human tragedy to him most, was hearing his father talk about this boy who was hanged for just being present. And you get the feeling very much that Hardy's sympathy is with these kind of, you know, slightly Ludditeical anti-technology people rather than with um, with this new technology. Although, of course, this new technology, as I understand it, Harvey, was kind of necessary for supporting this this move from this majority rural population pre-1851 to, uh, I don't know, can you, can you tell us any more about that at all? Yeah, well, uh, again, I think land enclosure uh, in England it, it is very important to understand because I get this influx of an urban population is because of the the destruction of a rural way of life which had existed uh, for in in some form or another for hundreds of years uh, but land enclosures were justified um, on, on the basis of a more efficient utilization of the english rural landscape you you had with the introduction of these machines which made for far more efficient work and lighter work and less need for people in the countryside and the ex and the expansion of these uh, of this way of la managing land and agricultural practices it absolutely sustained britain britain's ability to industrialize and to sustain these urban populations of london and manchester because without this intensified use of the land we couldn't have seen the the cheap food and the amount of cheap food necessary to sustain these often poor working class um urban areas yeah well and, and how does that work today i'm going to now turn to Lila and say how does that work today because obviously um as harvey's just said you know to, um, well, I think it's interesting because what you were just saying, Harvey, was about enclosing land by putting hedges around it. And and what I've just kind of seen Lila note down to herself is about um, the industrialization. Actually, then it, it, I suppose it's in that intervening period. It then expands massively and you end up with hedges. Yeah. So um, as things like threshing machines um, evolved into the combine harvesters that we now have out in the fields, I mean, if you hear the word you'll hear farmers talking about oh their combines do this it's a combined harvester it both cuts it and threshes it at the same time so it's a threshing machine it's a threshing machine it's a threshing machine <gasps> on wheels um and so but once you get them you know it, it there's much less labor of a threshing machine and when i was younger we did occasionally get a threshing machine out because the one of the wheat crops we grow in theory, grows tall enough to be a um, thatching reed. And so we used to have a threshing machine out for that. And that was constant work. Whereas the combine harvester, it's constant work. Someone is sitting on it the whole time. But there's just one of us going round and round a field. Yeah. And as the technology improved, the combine harvesters get bigger and bigger and bigger. And certainly over in sort of East Anglia and places like that, you will see fields that are hundreds of acres big with no hedges because they can then utilize huge machines and just go and go and i mean i think in comparison i think i'm right in saying that the farm tess worked on was probably in the region of 40 acres mm. um we have about about that much in arable ourselves and there's 
four of us who work the farm to various degrees of full time and there's only like one or two of us out on the fields mostly at any one given time working that land and then you know you go to these huge farms and and again in comparison one of our arable fields is about 10 acres 10 15 acres and we're, we're talking acres hundreds of acres um and it's just such a such a different scale um to be talking about yeah well it, and it's it's interesting what you're saying about um so it's so actually this it's really necessary to be able to support the urban population hardy imagining that somehow you could have a rural landscape that cut out threshing machines and cut out this industrialization actually wouldn't have been feasible within that period it there, it sounds like there wasn't the uh, the rural population to be able to work the land in that intensive a way that they had previously you wouldn't have actually been able to do it um which is really interesting but i think it's also interesting what you were saying about um the the social experience changing of working the land of kind of going from having like you know in tessa's farm what they've got a whole a whole society of them haven't they they've got like the dairyman crick and they've got angel claire and they've got three other milkmaids and tess and the idea that that can now be farmed by you know four people and and you're quite an unusual example i think in having you're probably more in labor intensive than than most farms today yeah i would say that we are more labor intensive than most farms um but that's partly because we like being small you know we've decided to have smaller fields we've decided to do smaller bits of more different types of farming mm -hmm. um so that we can yeah just by having a more varied landscape and having more people doing stuff as well yeah and and i know you've said to me before about the the community that builds as well and how you you do things together like the cider making yeah. and um and kind of like uh, bagging bagging up meat and, and stuff and those kind of jobs that you do together actually are quite tedious if you're doing it by yourself but yeah, yeah. doing them together it becomes a kind of social occasion I think Hardy quite often talks about that as something that gets lost as well yeah and just hearing about um how your farm like it's you know, talk about like I like, say it becomes a communal thing Again, to bring it back to the landing closure, because the landing closure is a huge area of uh, English history. Like you had land enclosures going on from like the 12th century onwards, uh, where you had the Highland clearances in Scotland. Usually, enclosures were to kick people off land so they could let sheep graze. Um, but then you, between like 1760 and 1870, you have about seven million acres of English countryside enclosed that's about a sixth of the area of england enclosed and when you enclose this land when you kick people off the, from being able to um provide from the, for themselves from this land you destroy the community rural communities were decimated in this time uh, in england and i think that is you're the hardy expert but that is such a huge uh i guess tragic cultural loss that uh we've never really been fully uh, been able to recover from because still now to to this day there's uh it, it, there's still a lot of private land that no one can really have access to obviously not for foraging but even to to walk on yeah well and i i have to admit hardy now i have to put up my hands again and say hardy doesn't talk about this but william barnes who is the generation before him who was one of his mentors writes a poem about the allotments that are coming in and because of the enclosures the idea that people don't have that land to sustain themselves and so which i hadn't realized until i read this how early the allotments were because i had always assumed they were kind of dig for britain second world war but the allotments came in as a result of a lot of the um 18th and 19th century land enclosures i think i'm looking towards harvey um to go more than I. I, I don't know about the um allotments part but yeah, the uh, definitely um, the 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 rate of enclosures at that time exploded, uh, and I think yeah, uh, the Parliament passed four thousand uh, individual uh, acts of Parliament enclosing specific areas of land in this time. So I can imagine how allotments could have grown. Well, and I think the hard thing that Hardy does talk about, he doesn't go into enclosures so much, but he does talk a lot about the changes in tenancy. And his family had a copy hold, which meant that um, it was called that because it's a tenancy that's written down in the court re records. It's kind of copied down. And so you don't have a kind of individual tenancy agreement. But it goes, uh, it's also known as a life hold because it travels through three lifetimes of the same family. And so you've got that kind of security. 
um, you know that for those three lifetimes at least, you won't have to worry about losing your house. Um, and then on the third lifetime, you can choose to renew it or end it as you wish. And that stops happening. And it becomes more like our tenancy is today. It's a yearly tenancy. So every year um, you get a new tenant in and if they don't like it or they can't pay the rent or you choose that they're not being a very good worker and it's a tied house, then you will hire someone else the next year or get a new tenant in. And Hardy says um, that that is creating a real disjunction between the people on the land and the land itself. And I think the way he phrases it is that people have forgotten the ghost stories and they've forgotten the herbs that grow in the different places and uh, they've forgotten the history of the families that lived in the area. And those are the three things that he's kind of like names as being specifically um, evident that, of the changes. And, and I suppose I was wondering how you feel, Lila, that works with kind of modern tenancies as well. Do you feel that there's that disjunction now between the land and people who are tenanting the land or... I mean, what, what's what's your farm tenancy? How does that work? Uh, our, our tenancy is a little bit complicated. Um, about So we've got about 600 acres. Two thirds of that is rented from the National Trust. Um, we're really lucky with our relationship with them. Um, we have a 10 year farming tenancy with them, which is unusual. Most people will have maybe a five year tenancy. So when you were saying one year, one year I think is fairly rare. Two years is more common five if you're lucky and we're really lucky we've got a 10-year secure tenancy um so two-thirds of the farm is is that and then the rest of it is either owned outright by my parents or by various different people and we've got i think probably just a one-year tenancy yeah you know, the, uh, how do you feel that affects your knowledge of the land I mean and and mm -hmm. how I suppose also do you feel that your family uh, I don't know, how, how long have your family been there do you feel that them having been or not been there for like generations and generations does mean that there's that disjunction between the land there and is, them yeah uh, there is definitely a bit of that so the core bit of land that is sort of tamarisk farm itself my grandparents started farming in the 60s um and i can already feel that loss of history mm. in that if i talk to my mother she will remember what the previous farmer was doing based on stories that you know she heard from from my grandparents but i don't have that information sort of deep within me. I only have what I remember her saying. Yeah. Um, and the same, even more so, applies to the two bits that we rent. Um, one of them we've been renting for 20 years now, and the other one for 25 years. Um, and we know some of the history of those, those bits of land before we took them over, but certainly not not the full detail as, as we do with the bits that we've been farming for longer. Yeah. Um, so, so there is that kind of sense of that longevity and that secure tenancy actually does still still yeah. mean that to people. It's not just hardy over romanticizing it. And... No, definitely. And you know, there's a couple of fields where like, well, we think this is what happened to them then, but we don't actually know. And it would be nice to know whether or not they had been, you know, ploughed up at this certain point because it would I don't know if it would actually make a difference to how we treated the field, but it would certainly make a difference to how we felt about what we were doing in that field. Mm. Um yeah. So as well as seeing people becoming more and more disconnected from the landscape, I think um, going right back and now we're coming to the end of our podcast, returning to that first quote that we started with about Tess putting the milk on the train and seeing it go off to London and feeling it was going to people who had never seen a cow before. And I'm never sure how to take this with Hardy because I think it's a really, really powerful image. But at the same time, it almost feels a bit like can can really you know can, nowadays have people are there still people who've never seen a cow in real life and Lila is putting up her hands yes <laughs> there are um the particular anecdote I'm going to tell you is not about cows per se um but it is very much related to this idea of disconnect um when we lived in London my partner Ben worked at a secondary school and he had to do outdoor duty on occasion and in the grounds of one of these places there was a mulberry tree and he would go outside when it was mulberry season and he'd eat the mulberries and he loved it and the kids would say to him uh sir what are you doing you don't know where that's been and he's looking at the mulberry and he's looking at the tree saying you know what i know precisely where this mulberry has been but you don't know where the rest of your food has been because it's so many stages removed from mm -hmm. you and it's just this idea that they can see fruit that someone is eating and not recognize that that's okay. 
Well, and also that weirdly the disconnect from it is comforting because somehow not knowing is comforting, whereas knowing where it's been suddenly becomes fraught with danger and possibilities. Yeah, and... exactly. Yeah. I find that fascinating um, because it's a bit of a different anecdote, but like my dad will come in and if they've not had certain produce, like let's say I'm in, I'm in Yorkshire right now and if they, have, they haven't got certain fruits and veg, he'll complain. And I feel like anyone will do that. But if you really take a step back and look at like the modern supermarket, it is quite bizarre that in the middle of December I can purchase uh, asparagus, mangoes, coconuts. Uh, I'm not even focusing on tropical fruits, but even apples and cherries and blueberries, all these different produce, be it uh, what we might call uh tropical or be it even domestic things we could produce domestically produce but it's out of season the modern british diet is very much completely unseasonal and has no regards for ecological processes or ecological limits because well for a myriad of reasons but i think this there is a huge disconnect with people and it's not as explicit as people don't know what a cow is or where milk comes from or they've never seen one but it's more people aren't thinking about what actually goes into the food that they consume. Like when you pick up uh, a pack of, again, I'll go back to asparagus. When you pick up a pack of asparagus and it says like Argentina or something on it, do people really understand like the scale of what that means for um, their diet and for the global environment? And and I, I think it's interesting that that comes in, you know, that all starts with this this migration of, of population to the center of you know, the cities and the introduction of railways and the fact that the railways suddenly make it possible to and i've also heard about you know like the strawberries from devonshire that are being grown on the it's the banks of the tamar and then are being put on trains and put up to london and you've got increasingly people in london being able to sample the produce from all across the country without knowing anything about the people who produce it and what they've gone through but of course we're now just one step further aren't we we've got matt because uh, another big point Harvey, was it the kind of refrigeration of um, ships? And so New Zealand lamb, I seem to remember, the big one that was around this point as well. Yeah, um, so uh, in this, at this point, we're on the cusp of uh, like can, canned foods being uh, a new technology, but also refrigeration uh, from a lot of the settled colonies uh, in Australia, um, New Zealand, and even some meat from America was finally being able to be brought to England and people's meat intake would in, uh, increase with it. But it again, like like what, like what you're highlighting with uh, what Hardy said, the divorce of people's consumption from the communities where it's come from is beginning to grow at this period to the point where we have now, which is a complete divorce from one's consume, consumption habits and the society's and communities where it comes from yeah and I, I think that's one thing I'm now going to go back to banging the hardy drum and say I think this is something that hardy does really well I think he portrays the rural communities that have produced this stuff and through putting them into books that are then being read by the urban community I think he somehow matches that joint I think it's my impression is probably that we can let him off a bit for not seeing the global because I suppose at that point the global food market was a solution to a massive problem that England was facing in terms of how to provide enough meat and other food to um, to this population are growing so quickly. But at the same time, I think that that is, that is the thing that is lost, is that disconnect between the consumer and the producer, and that that is something that Hardy's literature is able to do. So you hear about how Tess has slogged miles and miles across a moorland in the rain to be able to get that milk to the railway station to get into the city centre. And I think that's that's something that probably is still true today. We need to remember who is producing our food wherever it is across the world and what journey it has made to get to us. Although I'm sure that probably wasn't Hardy's legacy that he had in mind when he was writing it. Um, but I'm also aware that we are coming to the end of our podcast and so we need to start summarising this and basically come down on was Hardy doing anything new for the time? Was he bringing things to light that was ahead of his time? Are there still things that he can tell us today? And I'm just curious to get um, Lila and Hardy's thoughts on that. Um, I think from what you've highlighted, especially what we uh, what we just, uh, the last point that you made is a really novel point that although at the time wasn't, it was more local 
in scope that between the the rural farmer and the urban consumer now it's very much a global system that we that i think should be appreciating how these work for having that kind of perhaps not purposeful but that kind of foresight and he's not necessarily i would say he's doing anything particularly groundbreaking in his text but it's very much in a background of a growing environmental awareness in britain and around europe at the time so i think he's adding to a cacophony of voices um which later grew into what we would understand as like an environmental message or an environmental movement yeah i'm i've just seen um layla's got something to say oh I, <laughs> um to talk about um hardy i think what he's saying is still relevant and he's one of the few I mean, maybe it's because I live in Hardy country, but he's one of the ones who has lasted. So even if there were other people saying what he was saying at the time, he is the one who is still spe speaking to the modern audience in the sense that we still read his stories. Yeah. Whereas I've got to say some of the other names that you mentioned, I know some of the names. I would probably recognise some of the work, but nothing would I recognise as much as I recognise Hardy's work. So that definitely, I think, means that he's still current and relevant. But the question is whether the people who need to recognise that disconnect and learn about it are the people who are going to read Hardy. I don't know. And this is what Harriet just read in my notes, which is Jeremy Clarkson and his farming programme on Amazon Prime. Personally, I don't like him very much. I've never particularly enjoyed his television programmes. But he is currently doing a really valuable thing for us as a farming community, which is he is speaking to the people who need to learn, who need to hear it. And he is speaking to them in a way that they will listen to and that they will understand. And I think that's really important. So whatever I think about him in every other way, you know, that TV show is doing good and that. I imagine is what Hardy will have been doing at the time and what we would like him like, like his work to carry on doing now. Yeah. Well. I think I I think that's fair. I'm happy with that. Hardy wasn't exactly breaking all of the ground, but at the same time he was making people aware of issues that maybe they wouldn't be otherwise. Um, and with a nice little interesting twist that Jeremy Clarkson is the natural inheritor of Thomas Hardy's legacy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> and I think I think that's a brilliant note to end on. Um, but thank you both so much. It's been really interesting talking to you. I know we could have gone on twice as long as we did, um, but I, I very much enjoyed it. Thank you both for coming. Thanks for listening to this episode of Interrogating Hardy. Special thanks go out to our sponsors, Batten Solicitors, as well as our funders, Arts Council for England and the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Make sure to subscribe here if you want to catch future episodes. Thank <laughs> you.